Um, I introduce you the concept of density matrix. So how can you describe uh, a state when you have only a partial knowledge of a system? And uh, indeed, you, we, we are seeing that uh, we, we can describe the, the system using a pure state, so a quantum state like this. Because sometimes there are situations where you, you only know that there is a given probability that the, state is in, that the system is in a given state. For example, if the probability to be in a state is equal to pi, hmm, then you have to describe the system using this, uh, this operator called density matrix, which has this form. Using this operator, you can compute the expectation values of the observables in this way. So you, you should compute a trace of the density matrix times the, the operator. Okay? And uh, well, in particular, if you're interested in the probability of the outcome of the measurement, then this is what you obtain. You, you, you see that the probability of a, given outcome, of a given outcome lambda can be written as the expectation value of the projector on that particular eigen space corresponds to that particular eigenvalue. Okay, this was just uh, an introduction uh, on the density matrix, the formalism. Then we, we talk a bit uh, uh, about the correspondence principle in statistical physics. And I told you that uh, uh, the idea is to replace the classical density of states, rho classical, in the phase space, UMP. These are conjugate variables. And this is the, uh, the the measure of the of the in the in the in phase space. So you replace this uh, probability with the uh, with the density matrix in quantum mechanics. Okay. In particular, if you apply this kind of prescription in equilibrium uh, temperature T, what you find is that you instead of uh, uh, working with this classical uh, classical density, which is well known, keeps distribution is the minus beta h beta well, the energy divided by the temperature okay you you have to replace this classical probability by this density matrix which has the same form as you can see and now you I replace the energy by the Hamiltonian as we already do okay? as we always do okay so uh, then I also introduce well I just told you in the end uh, 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 something about the entropy of the state. Uh, we know the definition of the entropy in uh, class in statistical physics. Uh, we know that it measures the number of microstates with a given thermodynamic properties, in particular with a given temperature, for example, or given total energy. And uh, uh, so the classical expression, can I, can I raise here? Okay. So the classical expression is something like this, for the entropy is equal to the integral over the phase space of the distribution, classical distribution, uh, QP, times the logarithm of rho classical Q over here we should put something let's put divided by some constant because this is not a dimensional so we have inside the logarithm it should be something which is a dimensional and the fact that you have to put some constant here means that the entropy in classical uh, statistical physics is defined up to a constant an additive constant now, what happens when you when you apply this corresponding principle? Then, yes, yeah, rho is classical CL. Yes. Yes, I try. Okay. <laughs> so this is the entropy in the classical case. So using the correspondence principle, then we can write down the entropy in in which example? Well, this is uh, general. The definition of the entropy given a distribution, a density of state rho classical, then you can define this kind of entropy. And the meaning essentially is that you are counting this kind of uh, microstates. 
So in the, in the quantum case, then your gradient entropy will be defined as minus the trace of rho logarithm of rho. Rho, the density. rho is the density matrix. Hmm? Now, we will know that if we consider a system at a sufficiently high temperature, then we can neglect the quantum effects. Okay? So in particular, you should expect that if we now write the, if you consider the density matrix of a thermal state like this, and we consider the temperature sufficiently high, then we, well, we essentially find a classical, classical entropy up to a constant, a relatively constant. Okay? This is what, because we live in a classical world. So this should be true. But in order to see quantum effects, so we have to go to low temperature. And in particular, we, 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 can, we expect that the maximum effects will be present at zero temperature. Zero temperature where you don't have any more uh, classical, uh, sorry, thermal fluctuation, zero temperature. So the, uh, if you imagine a classical state at zero temperature, you imagine something which is frozen, so nothing moves. Hmm? So there is no correlation between the parts, so everything stopped, no correlation. But now because, okay, we, as a matter of fact, we live in a quantum world at zero temperature, so we must take into account quantum, uh, quantum fluctuations. And so this means that we should expect some peculiar, maybe peculiar behavior when we are at zero temperature. Now, first of all, what happens if we compute the entropy of the state at zero temperature hmm? with this definition of entropy? Now, if we assume that uh, when we lower the temperature, we, we approach a pure state, just one state, then it's easy to show that this is equal to zero. Why this is equal to zero? Because for a pure state, we know that the eigenvalues of the density matrix are either zero or one. Okay? Now, if, you, if the eigenvalue is equal to zero, this, uh, the, its contribution is equal to zero because of this term, zero times something. Well, this is divergent, but the divergence of the logarithm is much uh, uh, is milder than the zero of the pro. So, you know, if you plot x log x, as a function of x, what you find that this function is equal to zero, at x equals to zero, okay? And uh, uh, moreover, if, the, uh, if, if you consider the contribution from the eigenvalue equal to one, then this expression is equal to zero because of the logarithm. Logarithm of one is equal to zero. So you find that uh, if you have a pure state, then the entropy is equal to this entropy is equal to zero, the entropy of the total state. Hmm? This is the third principle of, uh, of thermodynamics. Yeah? You have zero entropy. You can imagine that, uh, that there can be exceptions hmm? to this behavior. Because I told you this happens when you, uh, you approach a pure state at zero temperature. Maybe in some uh, physical system you can have some degeneracy of, uh, of the state. So if you have degeneracy, well, this doesn't hold anymore. So you could have a finite, a finite entropy. But here, for the sake of simplicity, we are just considering cases where uh, you approach just a single, a single state. So the entropy will be equal to zero. What I mean is that if you plot the, the spectrum of the uh, Hamiltonian, generally you have something like this. Assume. Now, if you have just one ground state here, then when you lower the temperature, then you will end up in the ground state. But if you have two states here, with the same energy, then you can end up in a superposition of the two, or an incoherent superposition. Incoherent, incoherent superposition. Mm -hmm. Or not. It depends on the system. Because, well, as we will see, if uh, there is some symmetry in the system, and the symmetry is broken, at zero temperature, then even if you have degeneracy, then you will end up in just one pure state. So well, we, this depends on the on the system that you are considering. But okay, we for the sake of simplicity, we consider cases where we at zero temperature we have just a pure state, so zero entropy. Okay. Okay, fine. But uh, so okay, we we don't get much information from this entropy. No, I would say. 
nevertheless, we know that uh, at zero temperature, the, we have only quantum effects. So everything that we can compute should show some kind of quantum correlations in the system, which gives us some information about the quantumness of the system. So without that, we cannot get anything uh, from here, from S equals zero. But maybe we can uh, get something considering reduced density matrices. So let's assume that we are in this pure state. This is our pure state, described by a given, a given uh, well, quantum state psi. And now let's just consider a bipartition of the state. We divide the state in two. We call this A, and we call this B. Now, yesterday, uh, we have seen how to describe the observables in A. So let's just consider this kind of reduced density matrix. So let's say we are not interested in what's happening in B, and we want to construct the density matrix of A. We know how to do it, and we know that rho A is equal to the partial trace over B of the original density matrix, which was just the projector on the side. This is equal to trace over B of psi psi. Yes? Or, or yes. For example, it can be if this is a spin chain, you could say that the first uh, n spin, r spins are in A, and the, the remaining spin are in B. Something like this. Or if you have a system of particles, you could say, well, I consider just one particle on one side, and the rest of the particle are B. This is B. Hmm? They are? Yes. And yeah. So the total space is A plus B. Hmm? Okay. And so the, the idea is to just, well, uh, because we don't get uh, any useful information from the total state, let's see what we can get from uh, reduced density matrix, which we are sure will be something quantum, because we are at zero temperature. Hmm. And uh, now, but before uh, consider the quantum case, let's think about classically. So what we could expect if we compute something like this, so a reduced density matrix in the classical state case. So everything is frozen. Hmm? When I compute the density, the reduced density matrix, it means that I'm neglecting what's happening in B. But in the classical case, I don't care what's happening outside my system because uh, there is no correlation. So if uh, this was classical, then I would have expected any difference from uh, this result because I'm just uh, tracing over, uh, tracing out some degrees of freedom that are completely irrelevant for my physics. So in the classical case, you, you could expect that the entropy is zero also in the subsystem because there is no correlation. So this, uh, I'm telling you this just to, uh, to uh, make you uh, uh, think that maybe if we find some non-zero result, for the entropy of the reduced density matrix, this will be a pure quantum effect. Okay? So if uh, the system is somehow classical, then you will find still zero. Zero will mean classical. If instead we find some non-zero non -zero value for this entropy, then this means that the, there is some quantumness in our, in our state. Okay. So, well, uh, we have seen yesterday that the, the, uh, the meaning of this expression, and we have seen that generally this density matrix has eigenvalues different from zero and one. So generally, we know that this will be different from zero, this expression. Okay. How is this called? The entropy of A, of the subsystem, is called entropy of entanglement, or bipartite entanglement entropy. So this is entropy of entanglement or by part entanglement. Yes, I will write. Uh, Okay, so this is not the right line. 
So is this? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, I try to write. Okay. So, uh, okay, the name is entropy of entanglement or entanglement entropy. Okay, so um, this is the definition. And uh, well, let's see some, uh, at least some properties of this entanglement entropy. In particular, I define the entanglement entropy for the subsystem A. Okay. What happens if we compute the entanglement entropy for the subsystem B? We have a bipartition. So it doesn't matter if you compute one or the other. Oh, sorry. The answer is no. It doesn't matter. There is a very nice result that shows that the that shows that It shows that the entropy, if you consider this by partition, the entropy of A is equal to the entropy of B. Actually, the result is even stronger, because the result is that if you consider the reduced density matrix of A, and you compute all the eigenvalues of density matrix, which we call lambda I A, and you compute the eigenvalues of rho b, which we call mu like, lambda i of b. Then you can show that all the non-zero eigenvalues of rho a are equal to the non-zero eigenvalues of rho b. This is not difficult to show. If you are interested, we can quickly show why this holds. Uh, this, is, uh, what? this is a corollarium of the Schmidt decomposition of a state. So the, yes? Yes, exactly. What is important here for the theorem is that the, the, total, the total system should be in a pure state. This is fundamental. Given that, you can, bipart you can consider any bipartition and you will find this result. OK? OK, let's see why is this the case. We, well, uh, no, there is not. Indeed, this is one difference between the entanglement, uh, the classical entropy, and this entropy. Because classically, you expect that the, 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 the entropy of the union of some system, or subsystem is equal to the sum of the entropies. It's extensive. Now, when we go to temperature equal to zero, we find this kind of. Uh, well, is it because of the, because, uh, the entropy from the additive in the This is. Uh, this is correct, but uh, what happens is that in the, when you consider the thermodynamic limit at zero temperature, the entropy becomes zero, so you don't have any more of this kind of extensive behavior. You remove the extensive part. So at any, if you consider finite temperature, this uh, extensitivity remains, this fish, this property. Um, OK, you must be a bit careful, because when you, when you consider the extensitivity of the entropy, generally, you assume that the subsystem are much smaller than the total system. There is this assumption that you consider large subsystem, and you consider the union large subsystem, but the system is <coughs> always much larger. So in this limit, you find that the entropy is additive. If you just consider half, I'm not sure 100% that this is uh, correct. Okay, that it remains, it remains extensive. Anyway, okay. Okay, this is not important. Now we are at zero temperature, so the, end, the total, uh, the, the entropy of the state is zero, and we are now uh, we are wondering what is the entropy of the part. Hmm? And uh, okay, let's prove that these two eigenvalues are equal. These two sets of eigenvalues are equal up to the zero eigenvalues. And the idea is to, to write the initial state just in a basis of, the, of our system. And we choose a base which is a completely general base, an M of, with some coefficient, an M. And we choose a, a basis you know, which, is, which consists of the uh, tensor product of a basis of the two spaces. So what I mean is that 
no? B, B, M. Okay. So we we uh, we chose we choose some uh, some basis of the space A, which is some vectors, either A. This is a base in A. We choose some vectors by M B, which is a complete basis in B. These are orthonormal bases in that space. So a base for the entire space is just the tensor product of the two. So these are the elements of the base of the entire space, A union B. And then I'm just saying that the pure state psi is given by a, a generic superposition of the uh, of the elements of the base. I didn't draw anything very deep. Yeah. Okay, so well, now the the synthesis ran from one. Okay, the index n ran from one to the dimension of the space A. The other index. Index run from one to the dimension of the rest of the space. Okay. So this is a rectangular matrix C and M. Just uh, well to have an idea, let's assume that the N A is smaller than N B. So if we or smaller or equal to, then if you plot the matrix C, this will be something like this. So the number of rows is smaller than the number of columns. Okay? This is the matrix C. Now there is a, uh, a nice result, which is called uh, singular value decomposition of any rectangular matrix, which is a generalization of the standard uh, spectral theorem for uh, say the standard of, of uh, uh, eigenvalue of yeah, OK. <laughs> so and the, the theorem states that uh, if you have a generic complex rectangular matrix, then you can always rewrite this matrix as a unitary matrix times something which is diagonal, a rectangular diagonal matrix. Now I, I tell you what I mean. And then here you have another unitary matrix. OK. So what is this? This, this is a, the matrix D. It's a diagonal matrix in the sense, diagonal rectangular matrix in the sense that the, the only non zero eigenvalues are along the diagonal. Yeah? And then you have all zeros. Have all the other entries of the matrix. Okay? The same if the, okay, if the dimension are reversed. So if NA is larger than NB, then you have this picture. These are 0, 0, 0 here. And here you have something different from zero. This is the matrix D. And these are just unitary matrix matrices. Unitary matrix means that U, U dag is equal to identity. Uh, sorry, let's try. U, U dag equal U dag U equal identity. V, V dag equal V dag V equal to identity. This is a theorem that you can prove. I am not going to prove it. So, but this is just a result. For any matrix, you can always, always decompose the matrix in this form. So, unitary times this kind of diagonal rectangular matrix times other unitary matrix. Now, let's see the consequences of this uh, mathematical theorem. So we apply the theorem to, to our matrix C, like here. And uh, let's write in uh, terms of indices of the matrix C. So we have C and M is equal to U, B, B dag, and M. And this equals sum over L that goes from 1 to the smaller dimension between N, A, and n b of the of this coefficient here that we can call lambda i the the matrix elements on the diagonal of the matrix d 
So we have here lambda L. Okay, oh sorry, you have U and L, lambda L, then you have V dag uh, L M. This is our metric C. Yes? We will see in a moment. Okay. So far, they are just numbers. They correspond to this decomposition. They are just the, 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 the numbers on the diagonal of the matrix D. So we, this is what we find. Now let's write our, our pure state using this decomposition. So we have a psi is equal to the sum m goes from 1 to n a sum this is m this is m from 1 to n b then we have the sum by l from 1 to the minimum between n a and n b of u this minimum is related to the fact that well this is a, a rectangular matrix so you cannot go uh, I, I, the, the number of elements cannot be larger than the minimal size of the matrix, the, the minima between the number of rows and number of columns. So you have U, there is N L, lambda L, we done Lm, and then we have our state phi N A, phi M B. Okay, so now, well, we can change the basis. Our state, and we can define a new, new vectors of this pole. We define a new vector of psi L A, which are equal to sum over L, uh, sum over N from 1 to N A of U N L phi N A. Because this is a unitary matrix, then these are, uh, these are, uh, this is a, uh, this is normalized. The, vector here. Then you have a psi, we define psi LB, which is equal to sum from M goes to 1 to NB of V dag LM phi BM. So we define, we are changing basis on space. And so what's the result? The result is that uh, our state psi can be written as a sum over sum over L. It goes from one to the minimal dimension between N A and N B. You have here some numbers. Yes? Sorry, I'm trying to not to put your derivation to the first general set. Uh, that one, yes. This one? Okay. This is okay? Yes. Okay. If this is okay, now we, we are using this. Okay. And I'm replacing C by this expression. So now we have a psi, which is equal if you use this is a new definition of the new of the new uh, vectors of the basis. This is a lambda L times uh, uh, sorry, that is psi L A psi L B. This is called Schmidt decomposition. I hope this is the correct one. Okay. Yes. You know, you just need the properties on the total state that should be pure. Then C can be generic here. Well, we started from a, a normalized state, and U have always this kind of. C, what well, is a rectangular matrix? It cannot be a mission. Okay, sure. The dimension can be different. No, this is for a completely, well, this holds for any complex matrix. This decomposition, singular value decomposition, and so you can apply. It's a powerful result. So it's completely independent on the state, uh, independent of the state. So. And, uh, and you find this, this nice result. Why is this nice? Because now, well, this new basis is an ortho, uh, orthonormal basis. Huh? because of uh, the unitary conditions. Uh, so now if we 
from the state we compute the reduced density matrix uh, of the subsystem A. What do we find? So, uh, so if uh, rho A by definition is equal to a trace over B of psi psi. So this is equal to a trace over B using that expression of sum over L from 1 to the minimum between N A and N B of lambda L of uh, Psi L A Psi L B that sum also over L and N and here we have lambda N Psi N of A Psi M Psi N sorry N of B mm. We have to compute the trace of this. This is the trace only over the space B. So it means that we can just consider these matrices here. We, yes? Yeah, yeah, OK, I will do now. Yeah. So the definition of the trace is the sum over a complete basis of the space B, which we already know is this uh, psi, psi LB. Maybe extended with other with other elements. Okay, so the trace is sum from L that goes to from one to N B hmm, of some cap state which are C psi B L of this expression here. Oh no, L. I should change it. That, so let's write uh, J from one to N B psi J. Then here we have some over Ln from 1 to the minimum between Na and Nb of lambda L, lambda N, psi Na, psi Lb, psi Na, psi Nb. And here you have Psi J B. Yes? Yeah? C? Okay, C was just the coefficient of the expansion of the, state, the original state. So we had Psi, the original pure state. We wrote it as a sum over N and M of this C and M, just coefficient, generic coefficient, expanding the basis phi and A. Phi M B. So the definition of C is just the coefficient of the expansion. We chose a basis and we said, okay, this state has this given coefficient, which I call C and M. D is uh, D is, uh, is a rectangular diagonal matrix. So it's this thing. Yeah. So here you have always zero. Here is zero, 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 everything is zero, but here you have lambda one, lambda, and here you have the minimum between the number of rows and the number of columns. Because you see, it's rectangular, so you cannot have more. It's truncated, so you, you have to truncate. It's not a real diagonal matrix, because it's a diagonal matrix truncated up to a given, up to the, domain, the minimal dimension, the minimal size of the, the range. Okay, so. so we found this expression, but now we use that the basis psi LB is an orthonormal basis. So when we consider this scalar product between psi JB and psi LB, <coughs> this is equal to delta, chronic delta LJ. Okay. And the same here between psi and B and psi JB. 
So this means that in the end we find that it's equal to sum j from 1 to n b. Uh, sorry, the sum, okay, uh, sum from n that goes to 1 to the minimum and a and b of lambda l. Sorry, there is a there is a, a conjugate somewhere here because this is the the bra. So it's the the adjoint of psi. So I have a conjugate there. So I have psi l squared times psi l a psi l a. This is what we found. These are orthonormal uh, eigenvectors in A. So this is just the spectral decomposition of rho A. So we realize now that the absolute value squared of the of this coefficient lambda lambda on the diagonal are the eigenvalues of the density matrix rho A. Okay? We can do the same for B, and we obtain exactly the same result. Because now we have to trace over the state of psi B. We have exactly the same Kronecker delta. Delta, now we will have delta L, yes, again, delta Lj, delta Nj. So again, the same result for B, yeah? By construction. I diagonalize the matrix. <laughs> no. These are projectors. These are projectors on the other space, so these are just the eigenvalue. And you obtain exactly the same result for rho b. So for rho b, you obtain sum L goes from 1 to minimum between an A and A and B of lambda L squared psi L B psi L B. So you see, the eigenstates are different. In one case, you have A, and in the other case, you have B. But the eigenvalues are the same. Now, the entropy. So, OK, from this, you see that the, all the eigenvalues of density matrix in the subsystem A are equal to the eigenvalues of density matrix on the subsystem B, except for the zero eigenvalues. Okay. And now, for the, uh, if we compute the entropy, the entropy, the definition is, oh, sorry, now it's slow. So the entropy of A is equal minus trace rho A, logarithm of rho A. If you use the spectral decomposition of rho A, this is equal to the sum over all the eigenvalues, one of A of the eigenvalues of the reduced density matrix, which now we can call the lambda square. Okay. Let's use the same notation. Lambda square L, logarithm of lambda L square. You have this identity, and you find the same results both for rho A and rho B. So the entropy of a part is exactly equal to the entropy of the other part. Independently, how big is the first part with respect to the other part? And is there a physical way to get this issue? No, actually, it's. Because, okay, the, this kind of entropy of reduced density matrix is describing the quantum correlation between one part and the other. So you want this to be symmetric. Because if you are describing a correlation between A and B, you should also describe a correlation between B and A. So we, it's good that we have this kind of result. Otherwise, this, the, the, our, our interpretation would have been wrong. So this, uh, uh, indeed, if you try to apply the same result at finite temperature, you see that this doesn't hold anymore. And indeed, the, you, uh, this entropy is not describing the, only the quantum correlations, but there are also classical contributions. So it's important that uh, we find the same result for, for SA and SB. Are you OK? No, you're not. The upper bound of the sum is not. Yeah, but the, the fact is that uh, all the other eigenvalues are equal to zero. So that's true. Here you should put a minimum, 
But then I can also extend the sum, including also the zero eigenvalues, because they give zero contribution. So it's completely equivalent. OK. With this, I introduced the entanglement entropy. And uh, 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 maybe we will talk uh, later in the lectures about some properties of the entanglement tensor when we will use them uh, now. Uh, well, we will see okay, in a few days. But uh, now I would like to start uh, uh, discussing about quantum many body systems. Okay? So we change a bit subject now. So if there are questions, ask now. Otherwise, I, I erase the blackboard. Uh, well, it's uh, it's a convenient choice. Well, the, the definition is uh, unique, so you are, it's given by the trace of Santi, then it's a convenient choice to, to consider an orthonormal basis. Just for the calculation. The result is independent of the basis that you choose. Okay. It's okay, yesterday we talked about the spin systems of a single spin or two spins. Today we consider another uh, very simple quantum model, which is the harmonic oscillator. You, I guess that you all know the harmonic oscillator. You, you all have seen the solution of the harmonic oscillator. And uh, well, at least you have seen the solution in the position space. So you know that the ground state is a Gaussian. Yeah, and then you know that the excited states can be written as uh, what may be some of you know that can be written as the Hermit polynomial times the Gaussian. Okay. But okay, uh, today I would like to present a different, an alternative uh, way to solve the model, which in a sense can be easier, and uh, we don't have to to work with this special function Hermit polynomial or whatever. We uh, but we still are able to solve the harmonic oscillator and to find immediately the spectrum of the problem, of the, of the Hamiltonian. So, harmonic, harmonic, okay, maybe this is, not my So we know the Hamiltonian of the system can be written in this form. So you have b squared over 2m plus 1 half m omega squared x squared x squared. OK, right? This is the Hamiltonian of the Hermetic oscillator. So what does it describe? Well, this is a, a, a simple model, but it's very useful in physics. And the reason is that, well, you, you can imagine that generally you, uh, when you want to describe some uh, system in, uh, under the effect of some potential, okay, then you have always some kinetic part. If your theory is not relativistic, you generally it has this form, p squared over 2m, where m is the mass of your particle. And then whatever is the potential, hmm, what happens when you, let's assume that you are able to solve the problem, then you find all the eigenvalues, no, uh, yes, all, all the, uh, of the energies of the excited states. And then you realize that uh, maybe there are some, some level, energy level, uh, which, are, which have uh, energy sufficiently uh, low, sufficiently low that uh, you can actually approximate your potential with an harmonic potential. So independently of how complicated is your potential, there is always, generally there is a, a regime at sufficient low energy where you can change the potential, just consider an harmonic approximation. And, so, and you find so, an Hamiltonian like this. Yeah. This is why this model is simple, but it's very useful in physics. So it's not, uh, uh, it's not just an artificial model. So, so the, and this is why we started with this 
with the harmonic oscillator. OK, so how can we solve this model? Ah, first of all, okay, what is x and p? x is the position, p is the momentum. And we know, because this is a quantum harmonic oscillator, so position and momentum satisfy this commutation relation, i h bar, where h is equal to 1. OK, we put h equal to 1, we, we assume natural units. Are you fine with that? So this is our Hamiltonian, and we want to, uh, to diagonalize it to find eigenvalues and eigenvectors of this Hamiltonian. So uh, I, I suggest you to, uh, to consider some uh, new variables now, just a suggestion. Let's try to, to rewrite the Hamiltonian in terms of these new two variables. Define this operator A in this way. M omega over 2 x plus i over m omega p. This is just the definition. We define this operator. And we define the adjoint of the operator, which is given by square root of m omega over 2 x minus i over m omega p. OK. We can define this, these operators. And uh, if you want, we can recover the original position momentum operator by inverting these relations. And what do we find? We find that, I wrote it, yes. We find that x is equal to uh, 1 over square root of 2m omega times a plus a dag. And p is equal to square root of uh, m omega of m omega over 2 times x, uh, times what? Uh, uh, times i uh, a dag minus a. You can check them. And uh, uh, I hope that the coefficients are right, but I think so. Yeah. This, uh, this is just the definition. We define this operator, and we uh, this base is complete because we can express the original operator in terms of this new one, of the, of the A, A dag. So in particular, we can rewrite the Hamiltonian in terms of A and A dag. I mean, we just take this expression, plug this expression here, and let's see what happens, OK? What do we find? If we do this, we find that the Hamiltonian is equal to omega A dag. A. Uh, okay, okay. Well, this at A plus one half, which is nice, no? Because okay, it's uh, this is it's more compact uh, the the original method. But there is another reason why this is nice, and the reason is the following. Let us now apply H. To a dag. What happens if I apply this? Then this is equal to omega a dag a plus one half applied to a dag. Now, if we use the commutation, ah, sorry, I forgot to tell you something. Now, x and p satisfy this commutation relation. Okay? Now, if you consider a and a dag, then you immediately find using this that a a dag satisfy this commutation relation. So instead of having an i, now we have a 1. OK? Now let us try to uh, let us apply the Hamiltonian to a dag, then and try and move this operator on the left hmm, of h. So when we move a dag to the left of a, then we must take into account that there is a commutator. So let's write everything. This is equal to omega times a dag a a dag plus a dag a plus what is this a dag what is this a dag a dag a a dag plus a yes this is correct plus and we have one alpha omega a dag. 
of this. Yes. Now a dag a a dag is equal to one. So this is equal to omega times uh, a dag plus. Uh, a okay. Yeah. I did something. I did something wrong. Uh, just a moment. What I did? Data. You know what? Let's do it in a different way. <laughs> okay. We want to compute the commutator between H and A dag. Okay, let's do it in this way because it's easier, <laughs> apparently. So let's write the Hamiltonian. The Hamiltonian is omega a dag a plus one half a dag. Now the commutator between a constant and anything is equal to zero. Yeah, so it's not important. Now we, I hope we know, a, a, there is a very well known a property of commutator that we, you, if you have the commutator between A, B, and C, this is equal A commutator between B and C plus commutator between A and C times B. Okay, let's use this property here. So we have that this is equal to omega times A dag commutator between A and A dag plus omega commutator between a dag and and a dag a this is equal to one and this is clearly equal to zero because the commutator of uh, one operator with itself is equal to zero so this is omega a dag so we have yeah you convert to half because it's a constant, right? Or yeah, no, no, this is general. Okay. No, For okay. generic operators, you are. I mean, the half. Ah, the alpha, I remove the alpha, well, just because the commutator between a number and an operator, if you want, the commutator would be lambda is a number yeah. times the operator minus the operator times the number. Okay, thank you. So, which is equal to zero. Okay. So, we found this result. Why is this? Interesting, because let's now assume that the psi e is just the negative state of the Hamiltonian with energy e. Okay, so this means let's assume that h psi e equal e psi e. Okay, this is the definition. We define this in this way. Now let's apply a dag to psi e. So we consider h applied to a dag psi e. Okay. And let's use this result. So this is equal to the commutator between h and a dag applied to psi e plus a dag h applied to psi e. Right? Are you following this? What am I using here? Just to be clear, I don't want to do to lost you now because it's, some, it's simple. So the commutator between a and b is equal a b minus b a. So this means that a b is equal to commutator between a and b plus b a. Okay. So here I'm just writing this. H a duck equal to the commutator plus a dag h. But now h applied to psi e is the energy hmm, times psi e. And we know that the, a, the commutator between h and a dag is omega a dag. So here we have omega a dag psi e plus e, which is the energy, a dag psi e. In other words, this is equal to E plus omega A dag psi E. All right? 
So from this we see that if psi is an eigenvector uh, of h with eigenvalue e, then a dag psi is an eigenvector of h with eigenvalue e plus omega. Hmm? Now here I wrote a commutator between h and a dag. We could also write the commutator between h and a. There is a simple way to do this calculation without doing the calculation, which is to write this as the adjoint, the complex conjugate of a dag h. So we already know that a dag h is equal to minus omega a dag, so we find that this is equal to minus omega a dag dag, which is minus omega a. If you want, you can compute it again, but it is just a, a quick way to use the previous result to obtain the new commutator. Okay? So we found that, the, uh, and now if you apply this result, okay, if you now consider instead of h a dag psi e, h a psi e, and we do uh, exactly we do the same steps here you of know, the derivation. So now, but now we use this result about the commutator. What do we find? We found that the h a psi e is e minus omega a psi e. What's the meaning of this expression? The meaning is that if you start from, if psi e is an eigenstate with energy e, then a psi e is an eigenstate with energy e minus omega. Okay? Now let's consider the ground state of the model. How is it defined the ground state? The ground state is the state with a minimal energy. Right? So this means that there is no state with the lower energy of the ground state. But okay, but this operator gives us the state with a uh, with lower energy. Because if we could go down uh, with this operator, if we E is the energy of the ground state, we will find something, which is lower energy. The only possibility is that A applied to the ground state is equal to zero. It should be equal to zero. So we, we found So we found the property of the ground state. Energy is enough, this property. So we found that A applied to the ground state of the model should be equal to zero. Yes? They are not they are multiplied by omega, okay. And they are not natural natural number. Alpha integer. No, no, I'm taking positive of the other Ah, okay. Yeah. Well, uh, mathematically, you can prove that this, that the operator, the uh, the Hamiltonian of the amounting oscillator as a ground state, so as a minimal energy. Then we, we, here we are using, because there is a minimal energy state, then it should be that one. Okay? We are not doing mathematics here. So we, we just assume yeah. that it's a ground state. <laughs> Generally, what, what happens is that they, because we are considering physical Hamiltonian, and in uh, quantum physics, the Hamiltonian as the ground state, as a minimal energy state. Otherwise, it's unstable. It's not a physical Hamiltonian. So if uh, you have an Hamiltonian with this problem, then maybe you, it's Hamiltonian to be wrong, not the, not the solution. <laughs> okay. So this is the definition of the ground state. A psi ground state is equal to 0. And if you want, we can solve it. We can solve this equation. Because we know the expression for A, hmm, uh, which is a linear uh, combination of x and p. So in the end, this is a first order differential equation. Not anymore a second order, just first order. And you are able to solve this equation easily without uh, checking any book, I would say. So the ground state is simply defined as the state such that all the A, when you apply the A, they, they give zero. Okay? 
And for the following, we will use also another notation. Instead of, of, uh, um, of uh, writing Psaugran state, we will write this as vacuum. Okay, we will use this notation. So this means that when you apply A to this vacuum state, then you find zero. Which are the excited states? Ooh. Ah, no, first of all, uh, what is the energy of the, of the ground state? You all know because well, you, 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 you knew before, but now it's really easy because the Hamiltonian has this form, and because we know that A applied to the ground state is equal to zero, we only have this term. So we immediately find that the energy of the ground state is equal to omega over two. Everything without introducing Gaussian, or mid polynomial, and we obtain the energy of the, of the harmonic oscillator. Actually, we obtain all the spectrum of the harmonic oscillator because we know all the excited state. We just have to apply A DAG because every time that we apply A DAG, we increase the energy by omega. So what happens is that now we, we can say that the generic excited state is proportional to A DAG applied to several times, n times, Everything applied to the, to the ground state, to the, to the vacuum. OK, uh, by the way, this is not normalized. Hmm? But we, uh, we can easily normalize this operator. You get this, uh, this vector, if you want. Uh, do you want to normalize? Uh, I guess so. So I if you assume that the, the ground state is normalized, then we have to impose that the Okay, that's right. This is equal to uh, a constant times this. Let's try to determine the constant, a n. Then we have to impose that n, this is a normalized operator. Mm -hmm. So 1 equal to this. So this means that a n, this is equal to a n squared vacuum a to the n, a dag to the n vacuum. So we have to compute this. OK, this is kind of a, uh, it seems to be complicated, no? But maybe it's not so complicated. Uh, because well, what can we do? We can just rewrite this in this form. So vacuum a to the n minus 1, a, a dag to the n vacuum. I didn't do anything. I just isolated one a here. And now I rewrite this term as the commutator plus the, the operator is interchanged. So this is equal to vacuum a to the n minus 1, the commutator between a and a dag to the n vacuum. But this vacuum is like a five, so uh, maybe I, I should have written zero anyway. Uh, vacuum uh, plus five a duck to the n minus one a duck to the n a vacuum. I just rewrote the same expression using a commutator here. But now a here is applied to the ground state, so this term is equal to zero. And we all have this. Do you know how to compute this? I tell you the result. OK, yeah, uh, but because uh, there is a general, a simple result. So you can easily prove that you can easily prove that the commutator between A and a generic function of a dag is equal to f prime of a dag. Or in our specific case, the commutator between a and a dag to the n is equal to n a dag to the n minus 1. This is a very, uh, it's very simple to prove this. And uh, if you want, I give you the general statement uh, briefly. So let's assume that you have uh, two, two operators, A and B. 
such that the commutator, the commutator between A and B is just a number, lambda. This is a C number, C number. number. So number, well, just the uh, C number is an order number. Okay, cool. Now, if you are interested in the commutator between A and B to the N, then you obtain this result. It's N, uh, N, B to the N minus one times lambda. How can you do this? You just apply this result N times, and you end up with this result. So here we have the same kind of commutator that I showed there. So the result is n times ah, the vacuum a n minus one uh, n minus one a dot n minus one vacuum. So we found here that okay, there was a, this is just for this part. Let's remove. We found this relation, so the expectation value of a to the n, a dark to the n, is equal to n times this expectation value. This is a recurrence equation, so every time you pick a number equal to the number of operator here, so the first one is n, yeah? then you have to multiply by n minus 1, and so on, up to 0, so up to 1. So in the end, what you find is that this this expectation value is nothing but n factorial. It's the product hmm, of n times n. The first time you have n, but now you have n minus 1 operators here. So n times n minus 1, and so on. And so you find n factorial. Like everything, just to say that this coefficient here, a n, is equal 1 over square root of n factorial. So now we have also normalized, uh, we have normalized the, the excited states. So what is nice here is that we indeed we did introduce our polynomial and we already know the, the spectrum. We know how to write the uh, the excited state. Not the model. Okay. Are we happy? Okay. The, I, I guess that you already knew the spectrum and the eigenstates of the harmonic oscillator, but this is an alternative way, mm -hmm. and uh, it's uh, kind of elegant. So far, so there is no. We didn't learn anything more, I would say, with respect to what you already knew before. Just a different way to obtain the same result so far. But now let's consider a slightly more complicated problem. So this was the single oscillator. And we solved the, this problem by introducing these operators A and A DAG, which are generally uh, called the ladder operator, A DAG, and the conjugate. Now, the, uh, the problem that, uh, that I'm interested in is, uh, is a chain of harmonic oscillators. So let's complicate the problem. And this means that now we are considering, instead of just a, uh, a one-body system, just one harmonic oscillator, now we have n harmonic oscillators. So we consider many-body systems. So we are starting considering the kind of system that I'm interested in, in this in this lecture. OK, so. So that's very We have all this point with some spring. If you want, or well, maybe I prefer in a different way. I, I give you a physical description, okay? Oh, this is that. So let's. Yeah, okay. uh, mm, yes, let's imagine to have a, to have a crystal structure. So somehow you have some ions mm, uh, close to some uh, crystal size. Okay. So this is our lattice. Now let's assume that our ions are close, are close to this point. Maybe one can be here, the other can be here, and so on. 
So this, the white points are an, abstract, an abstraction, just the points of the lattice, but then the real position of the ions is this one, is the green, the green points. Now, if we assume that they interact between one another, then if we assume that there is a, 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 an harmonic interaction, so we are just expanding the potential again, uh, assuming that the energy is low, so just harmonic approximation. So you find that the, uh, this, the inter there is an effective interaction between the position of these ions with respect to the site, position of the site, which we will call X. This is X1, this would be X2, and so on. So if you assume that there is an harmonic uh, potential between the two ions, then you end up with an Hamiltonian of this form. H equal sum over or the side of the lattice, you have the momentum of the ions, and we assume that we are, they have the same mass, plus one half, again, you have an harmonic potential, uh, m omega squared, sum over all the sides of the lattice, times x, xi minus xi plus one squared. is at the displacement. So x is the displacement with respect to the end side. Okay? And this is the kind of Hamiltonian that you find. If you assume that the ions interact by an harmonic potential. You can expand if you want and you, you realize then that you can describe the Hamiltonian in this way. Okay? And uh, uh, this is, well, yeah. This is uh, also called the harmonic solid well, maybe something like that. But if we are in 1D, so solid, I don't know what, harmonic chain, harmonic chain. Okay. So, uh, well, for the sake of simplicity, we assume periodic boundary conditions, which means that uh, we assume that we are in a, Sorry. in a, yeah? Yeah? Yes, indeed, the I, it's coupled with I plus one, I minus one. So it's a chain of uh, coupled harmonic oscillators. But uh, I just gave you this picture just to realize that X is not really the position, but it's the displacement. Even you, you just consider displacement with, with respect to the, to the site of the lattice. You can interpret it in this way. Yeah. So in general, you expect that this, uh, the science will vibrate around this, uh, uh, this position. Hmm? And uh, anyway, so this is the administration of the system. And for the sake of simplicity, we assume periodic boundary condition. So it's like to be in a circle, in a ring. Yeah. This is just for, the, for simplicity. We would like to solve this Hamiltonian. Here you see that it's much more complicated than a single oscillator, because we are coupled <laughs> oscillators here. And uh, how can we do this? But there is, there are, also in this case, you can use your, um, um, what is called the first quantization perspective. So you can write uh, the wave function uh, in terms of the position of all the, of all the ions. No? And then you try to, to, you apply H to the, to the second function, you try to diagonalize the problem. This is one uh, standard way to solve this problem. And maybe you already know the solution. Uh, if you follow some curves in condensed matter, whatever, you, you know that you will end up uh, with uh, uh, finding some uh, oscillation modes. So you, you end up saying that the, the, the eigenfunction of the Hamiltonian corresponds to oscillation modes of the, of the ions, which are called phonons. Maybe you, some of you know this. But uh, OK, this is a way. But now I, I would like to solve this, this problem using the same approach that we used before for the single harmonic oscillator. Because in this case, it's uh, really convenient. Uh, you see, that it becomes very convenient. And what is the idea? The idea is that here you see that the Hamilton is a quadratic, is quadratic in the momentum and in the position. Okay. Again, let's write the, the algebra of x and p. So we know that xi pj is equal to i, no, okay, i, let's write l j is equal to i delta lj, because different ions, the, the, the variables associated with different ions commute. 
but you have created a quantum uh, the, the, the determination for the variables associated with the same, the same ion. And then you have the other condition, xl, xj, if we equal pl, pj equals 0. This is the algebra. Now, um, you see that the, the commutator between x and p is a number. So we could apply actually, the theorem that I told you before. So every time that you have a quadratic form, you have a, a, the commutator between, for example, x and a function of p. No? This is, I told you, f prime of p times the commutator, which is i. Okay. I told you this before. And we could, we could actually use this just to guess the right form for the operators that we would like to, to introduce. Because you see that the Hamiltonian is a quadratic form of p and x. Now, when you consider the commutator between x and p and this quadratic form, you will find something linear in x and p. So this means that we could seek for, so for we could define some operator of this form, a dag equals some linear combination j from 1 to, let's call n, the number of sides of, uh, uh, we put some, uh, some coefficients, x, okay, let's write this, x, l, j, p, j, plus p, l, j, x, j. So these are just coefficients. I could define this kind of operators, and we can guess that when we compute, when we compute the, the commutator between H and this kind of operators, AL, we will find the linear combination of, uh, of P and X, right? Just because of that. So the idea is to, uh, to try to solve an equation, which is the commutator between H and A dag equal to some uh, constant a dag L. Why we want to do this? Let's assume that we are able to, to find this kind of operator with this property. Then we can apply the same uh, chain of identities that we, we did for the single harmonic oscillator. And we can actually show that if psi E is an eigenvalue of the Hamiltonian, then also A dag L psi e is an eigenvalue of the Hamiltonian with energy e plus lambda l. So if we are able to find this kind of operators, we can solve actually the problem. Again, we can, uh, we can try to, uh, to express all the eigenstates in terms of this operator, like for the single harmonic oscillator. Yeah. Could you explain why you can make some test for AL? Okay. You can always do this, this because it's an answer. But okay, the, the physical the reasoning is that you uh, the commutator between x and p is a number. Because it's a number, it means that every time that I consider a commutator between a linear combination of x and p and our Hamiltonian, which is quadratic, will be linear again. So there is some hope that I can solve this question because this is linear and this is linear. If I had, for example, a term which is not linear in the Hamiltonian, for example, a term u x uh, 1 to the 4. I couldn't do this. Because if I put this kind of term here, now I know that when I consider the commutator between this and the linear form like this, I will find something as scale like, as x cubed. But uh, you cannot write x cubed using these answers. So this is, uh, it's important that the Hamiltonian is quadratic in this operator x and p. It's a very special, special case. It's an exceptional case. Yeah. So for this Hamiltonian, we can guess the form of this operator in this very simple way. And we, we can expect that we will be able to solve this kind of problem. Okay. So, so I guess it's clear why we would like to find this. Let's find that. So what do we want to... We want to do so. We want to solve an equation like the commutator between let's write the Hamiltonian sum over i of p i squared over 2m plus one half m 
omega square sum over i from 1 to n of xi, uh, xi minus xi plus 1 squared, commutated with that linear combination, sum j from 1 to n of uh, uh, this xj bj plus y, no y, uh, I call it d, lj xj, and we would like to impose that this is equal to this lambda l times sum j from 1 to n lambda x L J P J plus L J X J. Okay, because we are imposing periodic boundary condition means that X N plus one is equivalent to X one. Okay, periodic boundary condition means that the the site after the end site is the first site. So X N plus one N plus one is equivalent to x1. It's the same thing. So here when you have the, the term n plus 1, it means 1. We must solve this. Okay? It seems to be a bit complicated, but it is not as much of fun. So we can, it's just uh, two lines, calculation. So let's see what we have to do. We have here a term, the kinetic term. Let's consider the kinetic term. So you have a, pi squared, and we know that the commutator between p, between different momenta, is equal to zero. Okay? So the only uh, contribution here in this expression when you consider the commutator between the momentum and the position. Okay? So in general, we have to compute the commutator between pi squared and the term like that, which is some coefficient, plj, xj. Okay, this is just a number. So this is P L J, the commutator between P I squared and X J. Now this can be written as P L J twice P I, and we have the uh, uh, the commutator between P I and X J, which is equal to two P L J. Pi minus 2i, okay. delta ij. Uh, this is the imaginary, imagine, imaginary. So it's different. This, this i here is different from this i here. Is it clear? So this is just the imaginary square root of i. Minus two i. Okay, this is square root of minus one i. Okay. <laughs> and instead, this is just an index. So we can use this relation to to write this contribution from the kinetic energy. Then we'll have uh, to consider this other contribution from the commutator between this term and this term, because okay, the commutator between the position and position is equal to zero. They commute x and x, but x and p don't commute. So we have to consider this this term, which is the commutator between one half m omega squared, and we have a generic term is x i minus x i plus one square commutator between this and x j p j. Again, what is this? These are just numbers. So this is one half m omega squared x l j. Now we have the commutator between this and this. Now we have two possible contributions. Because we have, we have to consider when i is equal to j, or i plus 1 is equal to j. So here we have twice the uh, twice xi minus xi plus 1, the commutator between xi minus xi plus 1 and pj, I guess. 
and so this is equal to 1 half m omega square x l j times 2 x i minus x i plus 1 and here you have delta i j times i minus i delta i plus 1 j so for this term we obtain this result so now we can just collect all the terms and what do we find we find what do we find okay we find that the right hand side which is okay now we collect all the terms we find that the right hand side lambda l times that expression there, which I would like to write in a different way. Yeah. Okay, uh, do I use the Okay, no, okay. Lambda L sum over J from one to N of X L J B J plus B L J X J should be equal to when we compute the commutator we find this expression minus I sum over J of P and J P J divided by M plus 1 over 4 I M omega squared sum over I of C uh, L sum over well, I C L J X X N J X X uh, which X is this X J all this J sum over J. What is this C? I introduce now C. I define this variable now. So you can do the calculation, and this is what you find in the end. So you find that C, you have this expression where the matrix CLJ is this matrix. C equal. Okay, now I don't remember the matrix. Uh, C equal. Uh, okay. S all tools on the diagonal. Then there, are, there is a minus 1 here, up to here, minus 1. There is minus 1 here, minus 1. There is a minus 1 here, minus 1 here. And everything else, there are zeros. These are the non-zero elements of this matrix. Hmm? Uh, you see? OK, it's a matrix where all the elements are 0, but the, uh, the main diagonal, which is equal to 2, then there is the, this diagonal, the, uh, the next uh, diagonal, which is equal to minus 1, this diagonal minus 1, and then there is the last, the, the upper right corner, which is equal to minus 1, and the lower bottom corner equal to minus 1, and everything, in every other, other uh, entry, this matrix is equal to 0. Everything else. This is a matrix. No, it's just the result. Uh, I, I just wrote the result in a compact way, introducing this matrix. It's? If you want, it's a, yes, is the, is the representation of the Laplacian in. Uh, we didn't do any calculation. Come on. <laughs> so we just. Uh, uh, this is the. I don't think that you can. Uh, this, this is optimized, <laughs> in my opinion. <laughs> yeah? This equation here? So, OK, you, uh, here, you see P, there is this matrix that I call P. And it's the same, P. Here, this is the operator, the momentum operator, PJ. Then you have. Uh, Ah, here, N. N. Yes, because, oh, why is then? Uh, just a moment. Oh, what is N? You're right. Uh, the, this index is L. 
thanks. Okay, thanks. And then, uh, oh, yeah, just there is something. Let me check because okay, I I converted something. Um, so I'm not sure what is it. Uh, some of the JPL. What is this? And uh, uh, just a moment. Uh, mm, where is it? Okay. Ah, uh, just a moment because here there is a. Uh, oh, yeah, that's your right. Oh, wait. Ah, sorry, because there is no sum here. Okay, there was this mistake. No, no, there is a sum over J. What am I doing? J1 to N. Then you have P. I call this L. Okay. This is J and this is right. Then I have this. P. L is L, should be. This is L. This is C. X, L. Okay, ju just now because I, I did something wrong. The indices are wrong here. X, L, it's J, C, J, J, X, L, J, and J prime, X, J, it's X, J here, then I have C, J, J prime, and then I have X, L, J prime. Okay, this is the correct one. There is a sum over J and J prime here. There are two sums. I forgot the sum. Why? One fourth. One fourth. Because I I define the Hamiltonian in a different way. Thanks. Uh, because okay, well, <laughs> I wrote the Hamiltonian in the wrong way before, so I I wrote like one half is right, one half m omega squared. I wrote this. Okay. Uh, but okay, it, it's because uh, sorry, sorry for this. I use a different notation. Unfortunately, I I wrote the Hamiltonian without reading what I was doing there. So the Hamiltonian. Let us write this. It was in this form, no? One half m omega squared, sum over i of xi minus xi plus one squared. It was like this. Sorry, there is not two. There is an eight here. It's just a convention, you see. I can redefine omega in such a way that I have a two. Just for a matter of convention, but uh, okay, the calculation that I did, I put an eight. Yeah, when I do the I did the calculation. Sorry for that. So there are eight everywhere here. And this is why now we have one over four for the typo. Okay. Yeah. L is uh, just well. Yeah, yeah. I just, well, yeah. There is no L. Also here it's free. Eh? No, no, it's not sum. I'm saying for given L, there is a lambda L. And then it's not sum. Okay. So we find this uh, this expression that you can actually obtain. Uh, it's just okay. You know, uh, it, it would have been better to to solve it. Uh, so we have this, and now we want to solve this equation. Now we see that uh, both on the left hand side and on the right hand side you have a linear combination of x and p. <laughs> Clearly, in order to uh, for this expression to be identical, all the coefficient, the, the coefficient of xj should be equal to the coefficient of xj on the right hand side, and so on. Why? If you don't see it immediately, you can, for example, commute the commutator between this and pl, pn, or p, p, pk, or xk, and then you realize that in this way you can select a single term of the sum. So the result is that in order to this expression to be equal, you have to find the uh, you you have to select each momentum of the particle. You fix the moment the, the particle j. You consider it j, and then you you look at the coefficient of the momentum of that particle, 
and you and you impose that this coefficient should be equal to the coefficient on the right hand side, the same part, and so on. This is the only solution of this equation. What do you find? What you find is this equation. You find that the Here, you know, okay. P J N is equal to I M lambda J X J N. This is one condition that you find imposing that uh, this is P imposing that uh, this should be equal to. This, oh sorry, PJ. This should be equal to this, I guess. Hmm? This term should be equal. And then you have the other condition that I didn't wrote. Then they write. So the other condition is that P L J should be equal to one over four I M omega squared. Then you have a sum over j prime from 1 to n of x, okay, there is of x of c j j prime x l j prime. I forgot the lambda somewhere, lambda l. Find these two conditions. Okay. Now, okay, I, I I wrote everything in terms of indices. You see the, the, in the index n, j, you know. But we can write everything in terms of matrices and vectors, which is uh, uh, I I think uh, cre cleaner and clearer. And so, in particular, this you can rewrite this expression. If you just consider now this expression, how can you write this as p? You define a vector p of n. Oh, this is n j. I think this is n j. I think so. P n is equal to i m lambda n x n. Okay, now what j n? Where I put it now? J is N J again. This is N J. Where I define this vector, X N vector is X N with a coordinate X and J. Okay, I wrote the same equation, yeah? This equation. And uh, if I write this equation, I find that the lambda L P J is equal to 1 over 4 i m omega square c j anyway x l x j Okay, a bit of confusion with indices, but uh, you, uh, the, the final equation should be of this form. And this equation. Now you see you can plug one equation to the other. And what do you find? Yes. It's a lambda L because for fixed L is a yeah okay I, is a J but J, there is J everywhere. Yeah. Yeah, yes. Because here, sorry, again, uh, the indices, this is the equivalent of j. It was a mute index, index and I called it. Okay. So, 
What I mean is that U, uh, J corresponds to the, the operator that we are considering. It's the index of the operator. Because we are assuming that we can solve the equation H, H, A, uh, dag J equal lambda J, A dag J. So this index J is this index here, which is the same index of lambda. The other index, which now is in the vector, is the other one, is the end. Okay. So you consider this vector. Then, OK, check maybe if there is, it's possible to have typos here of indices. So. But I tell you the, the final equation. So if you plug this equation into the other equation, what do you find? You find this C, the matrix C times applied to the vector x j is equal to 4 lambda j squared over omega squared x j. You can check it, uh, do the calculation again, because there can be typos in the index, but this is what you find in the end. And if you know now the xj, then you can, you know also p. So you know all the coefficient of the linear combination of a. And you can reconstruct a. But now, OK, let's just try to solve this equation. What does it mean, this equation? Exactly. So this xj is the eigenvector of c with this particular eigenvalue. This is our matrix, our matrix C. It's very simple. Oh, these matrices are called the circulant matrices. Their property is that they have the, uh, they have the, all the elements along a given diagonal are the same, and they are cyclic. So these are called circulant. And uh, the spectrum of the circulant matrices, but also the eigenvectors is well known. And uh, it's very simple to show that the eigenvectors have the form of a Fourier transform. Which you you can, because this is a, like a periodic, periodic matrix, so you can a translation in the invariant, in a sense, matrix. So you can imagine that the, the solution is something like a Fourier transform. Yeah. Indeed, you can check that the, the eigenvector, uh, if you consider an eigenvector of the form e to the i to pi over n j e to the i to pi j over n times 2, e to the i to pi j over n times 3, and so on, up to e to the i to pi j, which is equal to 1, anyway. Uh, if you consider this kind of vectors, and you apply this matrix to these vectors, you find that they are eigenvectors. Okay. Why is this? OK, it's late, but I, I just, uh, let's just see why is the case. Just solve the eigen, eigen, eigenvalue problem for C. So we have, uh, we have to solve C times B is equal lambda V, right? It's what we have to solve. This means that C L N V N sum over N should be equal to lambda V N. Okay. Now we know that CLN is uh, 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 the elements of a CLN depends only on the difference of the indices because they are the same along all the diagonals. So this is equal sum over n of CL minus n. If you want, we can define VN equal lambda VN. Then, okay, we can just check. Let's write Vn as I suggested. So let's write Vn equal to e to the 2 pi i j n over capital N. Let's consider this kind of ansatz and see what happens. This becomes sum over n of c l minus n e to the 2 pi i j uh, n over capital N. Mm. What is this? Uh, now I can uh, shift n by l here because of the symmetry. So this becomes sum over n of c 
uh, minus n e to the 2 pi i j n plus l over n which is equal to e to the 2 pi i j l over n times sum over n of c minus n e to the 2 pi i j n over capital N. This is a number which depends on j and this is exactly v v l. So this is just to prove that uh, they are really the eigenvectors and these are the eigenvalues. Okay, okay I, I stop and uh, well, um, Next time we will complete the, the calculation and see the consequences of this. Yeah. You just tell me to what is the last step? You said because of the limit, you can write n minus l as l minus n? No, no, I didn't do that. I just the sum uh, l when. If you sum sum l, then you find minus n, minus n here. I shifted the indices. So I redefine if you want. Okay. This is an this is like an M here. Yeah. If you prefer.